Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Thursday afternoon, evening, wherever you are, edition of AZ Cooks Instagram Live. We are so excited as we rocket our way uh, through Aquaculture Month here. Uh, lots of things to talk about. Um, let me start off first by welcoming a brand new sponsor, the good folks at uh, Flor de Cana have decided to come on and join us as a sponsor. Um, very funny story and 100% true. Um, like uh, Halados Mexico, uh, one of our other sponsors, thank you very much, Halados Mexico. Um, and, and like Shun, uh, many years ago when I started working with them, um, companies that see me using their product or talking about their product uh, find a natural affinity for supporting us in the things that we're doing. Um, so Florida Kanya saw us using their product in some of our recipes five, six months ago um, because I prefer, I prefer to cook with that rum for a whole variety of reasons. We'll get more into it. We're actually doing some Florida Kanya recipes and I think you've heard me talk a lot about this. Um, but their, their, Añejo, their Añejo Oro, right, uh, is to me the best value in rum and it cooks up the cleanest. It doesn't become overly sugary. It actually has really, really, really good flavor when it's reduced in sauces. Um, and I actually make homemade vanilla uh, extract in it. It's, it's that good. Um, and I've used it for a long time. And so they approached us and said, hey, can we come on board? I said, absolutely, we'd love to have you. Uh, so thank you very much, all of our sponsors who make this uh, possible. Halados Mexico, Shun, and of course, uh, now Florida Kanya. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, uh, apologies for last week. We had some equipment issues, all of which uh, have been fixed. Settings on the camera caused it to uh, overheat. Um, uh, the, the amount of, of data going through one of the phones that we're using caused it to crash. So we only had a small portion of last week's uh, show on our YouTube channel, but it's there. And hopefully those of you that were watching live um, uh, got to enjoy it. This is what you always say when there's something missing, right? Like the night that Wilt scored 100 points, the game was in, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Only like 1,000 people were able to attend because it was snowing that night. But millions of people around the world say that they were there. So I will just say here, last week's missing episode of Instagram Cooks, uh, AZ Cooks Instagram Live Edition, was singularly the best half hour of work I've ever done in front of a camera. Ever. Ever. So, which is why you need to watch live. I'm just kidding. Uh, today we're doing one of my favorite recipes. It's the one that I cook for my family the most when it comes to a shrimp dish because I can defrost and clean shrimp out of my freezer in about 25, 30 minutes, do a couple of pounds. Uh, they defrost quickly under cold running water. And as each one is defrosting under the cold running water, I can peel it, save the shells, which I do in my freezer, so that I can make stocks and things like that. We've talked about that before. Um, and all I need is garlic, chilies, and olive oil. And I always have those in my house and crusty bread. And I always keep a bread in the freezer too. So it's the easiest meal. Take a look at those gorgeous shrimp. These shrimp are from the folks at Kauai Shrimp. Their website is kauaishrimp.com. And please remember, Kauai is spelled K-A-U-A-I. K-A-U-A-I shrimp.com and Kwai Shrimp is their IG handle and Kwai Shrimp is their Facebook handle too. Um, they are remarkable shrimp. I've been working with them for ooh, years now. Um, it's a Pacific white leg shrimp. It's found in the wild from the Gulf of California all the way to the western edges of Peru. Um, it's, it's known for its incredible sweetness and the folks at Kwai Shrimp try to replicate the natural environment in which shrimp are grown. Um, and they do so by producing it in the most eco-friendly environment possible. No chemicals, no antibiotics, uh, nothing in the breeding, grow out or processing. And it's just the way nature intended it to be. Um, they are a vertically integrated shrimp farm. And what's really amazing is that by industry standards, they're, they're relatively small. They have 40 one acre ponds and eight half acre ponds. They're only a short distance from the ocean. Um, and they grow in, uh, they, they line their ponds uh, with a material that 
make sure that nothing escapes out into the ocean. Um, they, they are frozen at 25 below zero at their facility right next to the ponds, um, or they're shipped out fresh the day of the harvest and they're sold whole head on by count per pound. Um, they are just absolutely fantastic. Um, and a special thank you to the folks at Kwai Shrimp, number one, for sending us these to showcase, but also uh, Kwai Shrimp are the people that I call when I'm doing a shrimp dish on the road for a charity uh, or some other benefit. Um, when I need shrimp, they have said yes every single time I have asked. I am so grateful. And because of that, there was something in their promotional materials I wanted to read to you. It says, in 2019, all their donations to local organizations and fundraising that uses their shrimp amounted to over $50,000 in revenue for local charities and organizations in need. I will tell you right now, they shipped me five pounds of their shrimp to do at a dinner in Beverly Hills that was purchased for Operation Smile that I did in 2019 that was purchased for $70,000. So you need to up your materials. But that's how much I love their shrimp. I, I mean, all I needed was five pounds. I could have used any shrimp in the whole world. I wanted fresh shrimp from my folks at Kauai Shrimp. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, why is aquaculture so important? Because if we're gonna feed this hungry planet, we have to use a smart mix of both wild stock and aquaculture and done the right way, underscore the right way, and Kauai Shrimp is one of those companies, it's doable. Uh, on to the recipe, pill pill shrimp. Totally simple, shrimp, salt, garlic, chilies, crusty bread, a big salad with like a mustardy tart vinaigrette, right? Cause you got that fatty olive oil and you're gonna be dipping your bread into that garlicky spicy olive oil when all this is done. So you wanna have a, a really yummy salad that's bright and crisp and sharp, right? Don't make a, a mayonnaise dressing right? Or a blue cheese dressing with this. Something that's sharp and acidic with lots of vinegar or lemon juice. First thing that I want to do is I want to season my olive oil. I have this on a relatively low temperature. I'm putting my salt in there. I'm putting a cup of sliced garlic in there. And you can see something that's not happening. It is not burning. It is not bubbling, right? because the olive oil is, I'm feeling the sides of the pan so I can guess, I don't know, 160, 170, 180 degrees, maybe rising up to 190, right? So it's literally just infusing the garlic flavor in there. I'm gonna throw a handful of whole chilies in there. These are Arbol chilies. My chili of choice because I can get really high quality dried Arbol chilies. Uh, all the time year round here in Minnesota. And I use them in all of my Mexican and Chinese uh, cookery. If you put them in there whole, they're just gonna make the dish warm. If you take one and crush it, it will make the dish a little bit spicy. If you want it hotter, toast a bunch of these, grind them in a mortar and pestle or you know, buzz them in your spice grinder or however you wanna crush chilies and put them on the table and let people help themselves, right? So once all that goes in there, little by little, I just raise the temperature. So I'm going up one notch and I'm just gonna let that sit there. The garlic and the chilies infuse in there for about, I don't know, 12 minutes. And then I start cooking my shrimp into, uh, in the sauce what is going to be the sauce, right? Super, super simple. And you make a beautiful presentation dish if you line them all up the same way and you put that out onto the table. Um, I wanna show you, um, I like to do this dish with head-on shrimp because the, the head of the shrimp has all of this incredible fat and all of these wonderful little organs in there that are so delicious to eat. But even though this is a shrimp that's raised in aquaculture, it's eating, right? And for those of you that are using other kinds of shrimp, you will recognize that there is this vein in there, right? And that is food in that vein. That's why it's black, right? So all that you wanna do is you wanna take a sharp knife 
and very carefully run it down the length of that. Some people like to use a toothpick. Everyone's got their little tricks of the trade. I just like to pluck it out and rinse it under cold water when I'm peeling them and just take the whole vein out, right? And I've done that with all of these shrimp right here. I left the heads on because it's going to perfume that olive oil. This olive oil in here is gonna take on the flavor of the garlic, the chilies, the salt, and the head fat that's in the shrimp and shell. There's more flavor in the shell and head of a shrimp than in the meat itself. So never ever throw away your heads and shells if you get whole shrimp. If you get headless shrimp and peel them, never throw away your shells. You wanna save them to make stocks and soups and all kinds of things because it's super, super, super valuable to have on hand. Let me wash my hands and we'll get right back to this. Now while, while, we are waiting for this to warm up. Oh, come on here, take a look at this. You can see right there, it's just starting to bubble. Now, I guess since that's an oil, it means it's just starting to fry, but nothing is burning. If you see anything burning in there, I don't wanna say it's too late, but you're gonna to start to put bitter flavors in there. If I saw some of this burning, like someone accidentally knocked the, the the knob and it just shot up and this started to brown and the chili started to brown. Before it got too carried away, I would just dump the shrimp in. The minute you dump shrimp in there, it just drops the temperature right away and the browning will stop, right? Because you can't brown in the presence of moisture or below a certain temperature. Make sense? Okay. So uh, while we are waiting for this, uh, we have time for questions, comments, criticisms, Anything that you want to throw my way, um, go for it. This is your time, so ask me a question. So if you can only buy frozen shrimp, what's the best type to buy? Or do you have any tips? 99% of the shrimp that you buy in the world, even from the best, best places, whether they're growing it in an aquaculture environment or they're harvesting it in the wild, 99% of it is frozen. 99, well, higher, I bet, probably 99.5. Very little fresh shrimp uh, comes into the United States. Uh, there are markets for it, obviously. If you're down in Key West or the Keys during the season and those beautiful Florida pinks come in or in the Gulf of Texas, if you're down there, they bring them into local markets, right? Santa Barbara, uh, spot prawns have, you know, a local season up and down the coast, uh, the West Coast. Um, but what's really amazing about uh, shrimp is that like a, a green pea, freezing doesn't mean that it's bad. And all these companies euthanize the shrimp in ice water and then freeze at such a high temperature or such a low temperature now that there's no damage to them. I've done tastings between fresh and frozen of the same batch stuff that is because it freezes so quickly. You can actually, I mean, within an hour, test them both side by side uh, in several different countries with many different companies and it's almost indistinguishable uh, flavor wise. Um, what I look for is size and reliability and I, and there's, there's wild Mexican brown shrimp that I love and there's kwai shrimp that I love. There's frozen product from down near New Zealand that I love. There's great Skull Island prawns that are really shrimp that I'm absolutely nuts about uh, as well. I mean, there are just dozens and dozens of them out there. What I look for is texture. I like a nice crisp shrimp. I don't want to say soft and mushy. Um, and I want to have a lot of that shellfish, that beautiful sweet iodine shellfish flavor. So why is it important to take the veins out of the shrimp? Well, let's say you're using wild shrimp or you're using shrimp that are in an aquaculture environment where they're actually eating. In other words, some places just pump nutrients into the water and that, that, that intestine is just a, a vestigial organ, right? Uh, but in other cases, sometimes you'll go into the back or the, stump or the front of a shrimp uh, into their uh, uh, stomach wall, into their uh, intestine, and they'll actually be food in there, some of which may be bitter. Um, I've actually had some really big shrimp in some countries uh, that have come out of the wild that actually have little bits of shell and other things in them from stuff that the shrimp have eaten. Uh, so you want to make sure to take care of that. They're asking if you can use, if you can only use dried chilies. 
Uh, no, you can use fresh chilies in this. The, the thing with fresh chilies is that they're much, much hotter, right? Uh, the dry ones are easier to control the heat, um, but by all means, use whatever you like. Do you remember when I said before this is a presentation dish? Um, one of the things that's really cool about this is if you notice, I've not raised the heat. We're just gently simmering there. There's absolutely no frying whatsoever uh, going on in terms of browning, right? I guess technically because we're in oil, I'm frying. But I love pinwheeling these out, letting the shrimp sit in that now infused chili garlic oil. Can you talk about how or if cooking and food have played a role in your recovery? In my recovery, um, for those that uh, are unaware, and I'm actually just going to hold on one second. Uh, for those that are unaware, uh, I got uh, sober in January of 1992, um, and food has been a huge part of my uh, recovery because uh, working with food is my life and as a recovering person recovery is my life and there are so many valuable lessons that I've learned in both about honesty about work about transparency um, about uh, being one of many in a kitchen instead of me on my own uh, there is no I in team and in kitchens we are definitely a team uh, so yeah, I've learned, I've learned a lot in kitchens that have helped me in my recovery. Um, it also was a very safe space uh, for me when I was in uh, kitchens in early sobriety, the first six, seven years that I was sober. I worked in kitchens with other sober people and so we had little meetings in the back and we were a support group for each other so it was really, really important. Uh, you can create that if you're in early sobriety anywhere in any environment that you're in. I was very lucky it happened in kitchens. Can you use crawfish instead of shrimp for the dish? Uh, you can use crawfish instead of shrimp, but you know, you have to cook so many crawfish per portion. Um, if I was doing, if I had a 25 pound bag of crawfish, I'd probably want to do a traditional crawfish bo uh, boil um, rather than use this recipe for them. Do you have any favorite knives? Yeah, I have lots of favorite knives. I have some boxes in the pantry over there. One day we should do a show us your knife drawer. Um, we'll have everyone send in pictures of their knife drawer and then I'll show you mine. I've probably got a hundred of them here in the office and I've probably got 200 of them at home. Um, like, a, like guitar players over the course of their lifetime collect guitars, I collect knives. Um, I happen to, I mean, the reason that Shun and I got together a long time ago is that the Shun people saw me working with their knives and approached me. Um, it's a great, great uh, Japanese knife company and I really do love their knives. And I'm not saying that because they're a sponsor because I was actually using their knives before they actually came on and sponsored me doing anything. Uh, so I do love uh, Shun knives. Are you adding any salt to the dish? I, that was the first thing I added and you may have tuned in uh, uh, a little late or maybe you didn't see my first move but the first thing that I did was um, put some salt in there just to make sure that it dissolved in that oil I know it always does but out of habit I tend to do that first by the way um, I would like to point out how slowly we are cooking these um, my friend Chris Hastings uh, taught me a thing or two about cooking shrimp when I was in his restaurant once years ago for a show. Um, and uh, we made shrimp side by side and he did one where he sauteed them very hard and fast in butter. And then he had another one where he sauteed them literally on like a match stick flame in butter. And it took about 15 minutes for it to cook under that low, low, low flame. And they literally just, they melted in your mouth. There was no toughness to the meat at all. Sometimes when you dump shrimp in boiling water, they cook so quickly, like two minutes, 
that they're almost hard and grainy. Uh, that the fat just comes right out of them. There's fat in the meat of the shrimp. Um, so I'm not a big fan of cooking shrimp uh, hard and fast. I like to do it slow. If I'm boiling shrimp, I'll put them in, I'll boil my water, season it with whatever I'm seasoning with, dump the shrimp in and just turn off the heat. And then I'll come back to it seven, eight minutes later and they're all cooked. I, I literally steep it like tea. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen my poached chicken, uh, Hainan style poached chicken recipe. Um, but in China, I learned to poach chicken this way. You take a couple gallons of stock, you bring it to a boil. You take two or three chickens, season them, drop them in. When it returns to a simmer and it starts to go from a simmer to a boil, you put a lid on it and turn it off. And then you go away for 90 minutes and you come back and the chicken is perfectly cooked and it is almost as hot as when you dropped it in there. Now I've seen, I think Kenji Lopez Alt uh, on Serious Eats did a thing where uh, he took a chicken breast uh, with skin on it and dropped one into a pot of uh, water and turned off the heat, water that was boiling. And the other one dropped it into boiling water and cooked it. And the one that took seven or eight minutes to cook in boiling water, it cracked, it was dry. The skin pulled back from it. It was just, it's such a violent way to cook the food. The one that gently steeped in the hot water, the skin covered the entire breast. It was super moist and juicy. I would encourage you to experiment with it and find more things like that. Now what I'm doing here, if you notice, I'm just letting them slowly, slowly cook. And what is cooking last? The heads, because they're the fattest part of the shrimp and the coldest, right? But all I wanna do is I'm just stirring to rotate that hot, oil and now oil and shrimp juices in there. These are gonna be done pretty darn soon. Andrew, when do you prefer dried herbs over fresh? Different uses for both of them. Uh, dried herbs, especially fien herbs like, you know, tarragon and mint and basil and oregano uh, taste different than their fresh counterparts and I use them differently in all sorts of things. I love the flavor of dried mint. It is way different than the flavor of fresh mint. I love the flavor of dried oregano. It is way different to the flavor of fresh oregano and aroma as well. So yeah, different uses for all of them. Um, for oleoresinous herbs, I almost always use fresh. That's like thyme and rosemary, anything that's on like a twig. Think about it that way, right? Or a stem. Um, cilantro uh, has almost no flavor uh, when it's dried, uh, but its seeds do. So I prefer to use it fresh. Is it true that when you cook with any kind of alcohol, the alcohol cooks off so there's zero percent no, that's not true. It depends how long you cook it and what the evaporation rate is. So if you take a, uh, a dessert sauce like a caramel and you pour a half cup of rum into it, it'll bubble, et cetera, et cetera. You whisk it together, you pull it from the heat, there's still gonna be some alcohol in there. If you take a bottle of wine and you pour it over a chicken and let it marinate overnight and then the next day you cook that chicken, you make coq au vin and you use the wine you marinated in uh, as the secondary liquid in there and it simmers for two hours on this, in a big pot, no more alcohol left. So it really depends. So how important do you feel that it is to cook the teaching children where food comes from? Or should they wait and find out? You should never, if your kids don't know where food comes from, uh, you're already uh, behind the eight ball. What we did with our son when he was two or three years old, we put a jar on the table with all sorts of food questions there. And we, um, we let him pull a question out every night and read it to us. And then we answered him. Kids need to know where their food comes from. There are so many lessons that can be taught through food. Lessons about math, science, language, anthropology, sociology, current events, ethics, right? It's vitally important that kids know where their food comes from.
Do you have a funniest kitchen incident? Uh, so, so many. Uh, <laughs> my God. Uh, yeah, most of them I can't talk about. Uh, here is some crispy, delicious bread, but I'll, I'll think of a story to tell. I'm just tasting the oil and the flavor of it. So, there's the dish. There are those beautiful kawaii shrimp. If you want to sprinkle a little parsley on top of there, by all means, go ahead. If you want, and you you one of those people who had some crushed chilies because you want it to be a little spicier, now is the time to put them on because a little bit of crushed chili on there will hit those hot shrimp. But what I would point out because we cooked them all really slowly and didn't move them or flip them, we, they've cooked with that ambient heat from that middling hot olive oil. And you go in there and the fun part of this is you have that incredible sort of burn your fingers deliciousness. And let me show you how to eat these is just as important as anything else. So I'll use my little piece of bread so I don't make a mess of myself. Ordinarily I would have my plate but you eat the shrimp and then you suck all the fat and juices out of the head. Mm. Mm. Wow, is that good? Now, Garlic, salt, chilies, olive oil. They can be big flavors, but in this dish, they're background players. The most prevalent flavor in there is that sweet, delicious shrimp. Questions? What's the biggest fail in the kitchen during the, during the quarantine? Biggest fail in the kitchen during the quarantine? Um, Oh, I defrosted a whole bunch of duck tenders that we had here at the office. Um, and I did the thing that I always tell people not to do. I lo lost track of time while I was cooking them. And, they, and I lost track of the fact that I'd lost time. And if you overcook them, you need to cook them medium rare and let them just rest. I overcooked them. I know that sounds like a weak sauce story, but I gotta be honest with you, I don't, sometimes, I make things that I don't think work out very well, but everybody seems to like. Um, it's kind of like, uh, for those of you that play music, you play a song and you're like, oh God, I, I blew that chord exchange during the chorus and, or whatever the progression was during the guitar lead and everyone else is like, that was amazing. And you're like, oh, I didn't play it right. Can you suggest any fruit pairing that go well with jalapeno and garlic, like for hot sauce? Food pairing? Fruit. Fruit pairing, oh my God, yes. Uh, melons, papayas, mangoes, we just made a chamoy. D Vicky, do we have the chamoy recipe on our website? Yes. Um, I'm in love with, do we? Oh, I have one here. This is actually, I saw these uh, uh, in my supermarket and I posted about it. That's how the Halados Mexico people found me. Uh, this is mango with spicy chamoy. Chamoy is made with jam and chilies and lime. Uh, and salt. Um, it's sour, salty, uh, spicy, and sweet. Uh, and <laughs> I'm telling you, it's out of sight with fruit. Um, so we have a, my homemade chamoy recipe is on the website. We're gonna be cooking it with you and doing some dishes with chamoy uh, in honor of Halados Mexico uh, later on in October. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, mangoes, pineapples, papayas, melons, watermelon. I mean, especially with, you mix that with spicy, salty, sour things and you are just gonna be out of sight. Absolutely out of sight. Are there any South African dishes you really like? South African dishes? Um, too many to name. Um, 
I made at last year's Charlie's Theron Africa Outreach uh, Program charity event in New York at the museum, I think it was at the Museum of Africa. I forget where they held it. Uh, I made a dish there uh, that was my favorite paste research, which is, you know, Cook Sisters, which is a fried dough ball soaked in syrup. But when I'm in South Africa or Southern Africa, and there's a difference, right? South Africa is the country. South Africa would include Namibia and Botswana. All I'm doing is eating naked food, right? The best fish and seafood in the world comes out of the waters off the coast of Namibia and South Africa. The best, the best meat in the world is found there. The wild hoofed animals that are there are absolutely unbelievable. And where I do most of my eating when I'm there are in what are called shisayama, burning meat stalls. So whether it's, whether it's a cow or whether you're in a, uh, a far flung corner of the country out in the wild where people have wild kudu or other hoofed animals or antelopes, just make a fire, mm, shrimp shell. They just make a fire, they start cooking slices of meat, uh, they serve a little condiment of like salt mixed with chilies and some sort of ground seed herbs, uh, usually coriander seed. And uh, based on how much you eat, they'll charge you a dollar or two dollars or three dollars for standing there and eating, then you move along. Um, it's just absolutely incredible. And for those of you that don't know, the waters on the, uh, just along the entire Southern Peninsula uh, of Africa, the continent, are some of the cleanest and fastest moving currents in the world. And the shellfish and the fish there is unbelievable. The best I've ever tasted, not even close to seafood from anywhere else. So they're asking, someone called After Into Monster said, I just ordered some fennel, tell me what to do. Oh my God, fennel bulb. Um, I trim the fennel, I poach them uh, in uh, water that I season uh, with butter and honey and salt and a sliced lemon. Uh, cook it for about a half an hour, turn the heat off, let them cool, pull them out, quarter them, and put them in a 500 degree oven on a tray and they'll just caramelize right up. They're fantastic. We have several recipes on our website uh, that feature fennel, um, including Michael Romano, who was the, uh, I mean, the Union Square Cafe's opening chef. He's the uh, corporate executive chef in all of USHG. I think he's the corporate executive chef emeritus or something. He's got some fantastic title. One of the greatest American chefs of last, uh, uh, this or any century. Just an incredible human being, a great chef. And uh, Michael Romano did a uh, asabuco with uh, fennel and orange and sherry wine vinegar. And I've adapted that recipe for duck legs, for pork shanks, for you name it. It's wonderful. Lots of fennel in that recipe. Fennel and orange and sherry wine vinegar have a great affinity for each other. Slice fennel really thin on a mandolin, uh, put it in ice water, then dry it. It's, it's nice and curly and crisp. And then toss it with sherry wine vinegar, olive oil, salt, some olives, and some orange segments, and you will be fantastic. Vicky is Spanish. The middle I start saying oranges and olives, she starts to like, she, she floats like a half inch off the ground. Would you add a little brandy to this recipe for an extra kick? Absolutely not. Drink your brandy on the side if that's your jam. Let's see, there are many questions. Oh, hey, any, here's something. A couple of announcements. Uh, anyone who lives uh, within a couple hours drive of Minneapolis, uh, look on my social uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we are going to be doing a special pop-up, uh, the first one that we've ever participated in. Uh, we're going to raise a lot of money for some really cool charities, uh, for World Central Kitchen, for Seatop, and for um, Second Harvest Heartland. So stay close to my social for that information. It's going to be really, really, really fun. What's your favorite way to cook and season salmon? To cook and season salmon? Oh my gosh, it, it, I want a whole fish, scale it, gut it, put some cuts, lateral cuts in it, 
put chermoula in it and throw it on the grill. Two sides, pull it off and eat the whole fish. In honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, what is your favorite Mexican dish? I, I go to Mexico at least twice a year. Um, the quarantine thing is killing me. Um, I love the people of Mexico. I love the culture of Mexico. Uh, and obviously I love the food of Mexico. Um, I mean, it's just too much to mention. Mexican food and Chinese food in depth and breadth, volume, technique, regionality, number of ingredients are the two biggest, you know, temples of food on planet Earth. Um, it's just a massive, uh, I mean, if I had to get, what do I think about the most? I think the most about some of the towns about two hours north of Mexico City, uh, the old uh, Aztec villages, uh, where you go into the public markets and there's still people there cooking traditional pre-colonial foods. Um, I think that's probably my, my favorite my favorite type of Mexican food. Then again, every time I go to Mexico, I will, even if I'm going on to somewhere else, I will overnight in Mexico City. Uh, I go out to Xochimilco, to the market there that's right on the edge of the Chiampas. And uh, I stuff my face in their food hall uh, with the best tamales, those incredible quesadillas with uh, corn smut, the corn fungus. Um, I'm just a I mean, <laughs> Mexican food, what's my favorite? That's it's just too big a question. So there are a couple of questions about bizarre foods, but what's, do you have like a best of something you ate? Best of, oh my gosh. You know, we made 800 episodes of that show. Um, it's, I, I, I literally, I, all I keep thinking about is the oysters that I had in Botswana, uh, raised three miles at sea. Bellon Oysters, because it was a French-owned oyster company raising food down off the coast of Botswana in Southern Africa, that were four or five years old. They were the size of butter dishes. I mean, I just, all I keep thinking about is uh, the antelope uh, that, we, uh, that we hunted with some tribal people and threw onto the grill, or the wildebeest that we had, or the kudu, my favorite meat in the whole world, which is kudu that I had there. Um, or roaming the streets at night, uh, eating Cook Sisters. I mean, I'm just, all I'm thinking about is all of our South Africa episodes in Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa. We shot a lot there. What would you consider a good dish to make for a first date? You got to make Rilaman pasta. Come on. Is, uh, uh, it, well, it doesn't matter whether you're a, a man, a woman, or a Martian, and who's coming over for that first date. Um, but as long as they don't have an issue with gluten, right? <sighs> Reel them in pasta. Get, go to your best, go, go to our website. We just did, last week, Vicky posted, it was like pasta week. So we had, one of our posts has four or five of our most popular pasta recipes. Any one of those will reel in whatever, whoever you make that dish for ain't leaving until the next morning. I guarantee you. What's your go-to burger recipe? My go-to recipe is I find the best meat I can possibly get my hands on, grind it, grill it, serve it with salt on a burger and absolutely nothing else. Salt, meat, bun. I love charred burgers, rare to medium rare with really high quality meat. Any advice to someone that wants to become a cook? Uh, yeah, it's like playing rock and roll music. Get out with people who really know how to cook and do it. You know, hey, we have to save our restaurant industry, right? So that people who want to pursue uh, that lifestyle have an opportunity to do so. Um, 15 million jobs are at stake. Please go to saverestaurants.com, sign up, write your congressperson or your senator directly from the widget that's on our website there and help us to save restaurants. Look in my social for a note about uh, our big event next Tuesday here in the Twin Cities. Um, thank you, Kawhi Shrimp, for this incredible product. Uh, folks can go to kawaiishrimp.com and learn more about the shrimp. Follow them on social. It's Kawhi Shrimp on Instagram. You can order from their website. Uh, they, it's, it's an incredible product. Trust me on this. Uh, just absolutely 
excuse me, absolutely delicious. Um, thank you to our new sponsor, Flor de Caña. Thank you to Shun and to the folks at Jalados Mexico. We really appreciate you. Uh, lots of questions in our, our social still about where to find our spices, Walmart or BadiaSpices.com. Both those places, or links on, on our website too. So it's super simple. Go to andrewzimmer.com and click and it'll take you right there and you can buy our spices. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you next Thursday.